My talk today is actually going to revolve around two stories with some analysis involving politics, sociology, economics, even a little bit of math uh, sprinkled in. And the first story is historical, whereas the second is personal. And at the end of these two stories, I'll try to offer a few lessons that I at least uh, take from them. Uh, the first story grows out of the nation's founding. Uh, in setting up a meaningful yet limited federal government in 1787, we were confronted with a big question about how it is that we wanted to pick our president. We, we were clear that we didn't want a king, because that had not worked out very well for us. So we rejected any kind of a monarchy. Uh, and indeed, George Washington was a consensus pick for the first president, in part because he had no male heirs. And there was no concern that the, the presidency would devolve into some kind of monarchy with his sons. Uh, we also didn't want a parliamentarian system where the legislature picks the chief executive, as is true in a lot of European models. We wanted Congress and the president to be at odds with each other, to check and balance each other. So we couldn't just give it to Congress to say, you pick the national executive leader. So we needed a new model, a third way. And what we settled on is modernly referred to as the electoral college. That term actually doesn't appear in the Constitution. The Constitution refers to electors, a group of whom together pick the president. And then Article Two of the Constitution, we see that the electors in this so-called electoral college are chosen by each state. It's a very decentralized system. So each state gets a number of electors equal to the number of members of the House of Representatives that come from that state, plus the number of senators that come from that state, which is two because every state has the same representation in the Senate. So in California, we have 55 um, uh, electors. Now, the question is why we chose this complicated, decentralized um, method, wherein uh, the president might be popular among this group of electors, but not necessarily the country as a whole. Now, one possibility is that we distrusted people, that the framers were elitist, they didn't believe in popular elections, and they wanted to give the decision to some kind of refined um, uh, group of individuals who could act uh, uh, where we couldn't be trusted to act properly. But I don't think that works, because with respect to the House of Representatives, which was, in the framers' mind, the most important of the branches of the federal government, you can see in Article I that the House is directly elected by the people every two years. So the concern was not that the people couldn't handle elections. I think if you ask what's the difference between the House of Representatives and a national president, it comes down to information. Remember, in 1787, you don't have television and radio, let alone the internet. You don't have telegraph. You don't have steam trains. So how would the people of any locality really know about anybody who comes from another part of the country such that the presidential election nationwide could ever be meaningful? That's why a presidential election was not really thinkable easily in 1787, because you couldn't imagine logistically and mechanically how someone could wage any kind of meaningful campaign. But by the early 1800s, something changed that did make a national popular election feasible, and that was the advent of political parties. When you had national parties that operate in every state, then the party can put forward some candidates, and the local people wouldn't need to see or hear the candidate they would know about the candidate because of what they knew about the party, and they could vote on that basis. And yet, even in 1804, when we adopted the 12th Amendment, we chose to keep the Electoral College rather than move to a national popular vote. So we had an opportunity at that point, if we wanted to technologically because of parties, to have an election, but we chose not to. So why did we do it? It's not about elitism. It's not about distrusting the people. Why did we? to it in, in the early 1800s. Well, conventional wisdom says it's about small states. That small states are overrepresented in the Electoral College, so it was about giving something to small states to keep them happy and keep them in the Union. But in fact, small states don't really fare very well under the Electoral College. Think about US history. How many presidents hail from small states? Maybe two in the whole country's history. Since the Civil War, Bill Clinton is the only president who comes from, sorry Arkansas, a non-consequential state. <laughs> Everybody else comes from mid-sized or big states. Moreover, if you think about where the elections are, the campaigns are waged modernly, no one's talking about winning, you know, the Arkansas of the world or the South Dakotas of the world. The states that drive everything are what? Florida, Ohio, Virginia, Pennsylvania, it's mid-sized and bigger states that capture all the campaign attention. Why is that? 
because of something that all states have decided to do, save for a few, it, which is to give their electors on a winner-take-all basis. What does that mean? Take Florida. Florida has 29 electoral college votes. If Florida allocated those 29 votes in proportion to the popularity that someone had in the state, so if you win a little bit more than half of Florida's popular support, you get 15 of those 29 votes, a candidate really wouldn't care about winning Florida. Whether he gets 15 or 14, 16 or 13, it doesn't matter a lot. But if Florida says, hey, you come to Florida, and if you can win a little bit more support than your, your opponent by making promises that Floridians care about, you'll pick up all 29 of our votes. That's rational. That's what every state, save a couple, does. But winner take all helps mid-sized and large states. It hurts small states because they don't have enough of a bounty to really matter, which is why the states that count in modern presidential elections are those states with enough electors as a whole to make a difference where the median voter in that state may be undecided, such that if you go into that state and you pick up the, the swing center of that state, you get the whole bounty. That's not about small states. So if the Electoral College wasn't about elitism and it wasn't about small states, what is it about? Well, like so many things at the founding, you can't understand the Electoral College without understanding slavery. Slavery ramifies through most aspects of the Constitution, including the, con the, uh, the Electoral College provision, and the real problem with the general national election was summarized by James Madison, namely that the North has more voters, and the North will win these elections, and the South won't like that because the South is worried about slavery and whether the North wants to shut it down ultimately. We're 75 years away from the Civil War, but people see the writing on the wall. They know what's happening. And they worried that if the Northern voters could outnumber the Southern voters, it wouldn't be good for the South, so they weren't going to join the Constitution if you had a national popular vote. Well, how does the Electoral College help the South? It helps the South because of this unholy compromise known as the three-fifths clause of the Constitution. Remember the formula for the Electoral College. Every state gets the same number of electors in the Electoral College as is equal to the numbers of House members they have plus two senators. But at the founding, southern states got three-fifths of a person credit for every slave. So they had a bigger representation in the House and thus a bigger representation in the Electoral College even though they would never let their slaves vote. So the South got to count property, that's how they considered slaves, as part of their population base for the House and the Electoral College, and that's why they had an advantage over the North. So Pennsylvania, for example, has 10% more voters than Virginia, yet Virginia has more electors in the Electoral College. So what happens in the early elections? From 1788 to 1820, so 32 out of the country's first 36 years, a white slave-owning Virginian is president. Virginia wins all of the presidential elections. Now notice the Electoral College creates a disincentive to for states to encourage people to vote. A state has the same clout in the Electoral College whether 1 million of its people vote or whether 10 million of its people vote. So there's no incentive to empower African Americans to vote, or women to vote. One of the reasons there was no women's suffrage is because states didn't get anything out of it in the Electoral College. They're going to have the same number of House members, and they're going to have the same say in the Electoral College whether they are progressive in extending the franchise to women or not. Indeed, if we allowed a national popular vote, then early states would have said to themselves, gee, you know, if we let our women vote, then we can have a bigger say in this national election. And that would, that would create a dilemma for them, because they don't want women to vote, but they want a, a bigger say for their regional interests, and they didn't want to be tempted in that way, and that's part of what happened in the Electoral College as well. So if we have something that has kind of tainted origins, should we really reconsider it in favor of something uh, that's more egalitarian today, where everyone's vote counts the same? Well, some modern arguments that have been advanced to uh, maintain the Electoral College include the following. Well, if you change the Electoral College, you're going to hurt Republicans and help Democrats. It's all about having Democrats win the White House. It's true that in 2000, George Bush won the Electoral College even though Al Gore beat him in the national popular vote count. But most analysts who thought in 2000 that the winner of the Electoral College was going to be the loser in the popular vote count thought that Gore was going to be the beneficiary of the Electoral College. They thought Bush would beat Gore popularly, but that Gore would beat Bush in the Electoral College. Look at the election of 2004. 
George Bush drugs John Kerry by 3 million votes nationwide. 3 million votes. Kerry loses Ohio by 100,000. If Kerry had won Ohio, he would have won the Electoral College. If the weather had been a little bit better in Ohio, and Kerry had done a little bit of a better job in Ohio, he might have been president, even though nationally, George Bush would have beat him by 3 million votes. So it's not about Republican or Democrat. We're at a moment in US history where it's not clear the Electoral College favors either party in particular. Well, what about the idea that if you have an electoral college, you're more likely to have someone who has broad geographic appeal rather than just regional appeal? Well, I guess as to that, I would say a few things. First, we live in a country where most people think of themselves as Americans first and members of their state second. You ask someone today, you know, uh, from, if you meet someone in Europe, someone says, where do you come from? You don't say, I come from California. You say, I come from the United States. 200 years ago, that wasn't true. People thought of themselves as Virginians. Robert E. Lee was asked by Abraham Lincoln to lead the Union forces, but he declined because Virginia had seceded, and it was unthinkable to him that he would abandon his state. We don't think that in those terms today. We're much more nationally unified, and even in a presidential election, a lopsided state is 60-40, not 80-20. So it's not like anyone who wins the, the, the election uh, nationally can really uh, have only uh, regional support and no broad-based support. Look at what happened in 2000. Um, you have red blocks and blue blocks. There's no checkerboard. There's contiguous blocks of states where both of the parties have support. Abraham Lincoln wasn't even on the ballot in southern states, and he won the presidency. And lest you think that 2000 and 1860 are anomalous, I gave you 1896. Look at this, it's very interesting. It's totally inverted. The Democratic Party here dominates the South. The Republicans dominate the Midwest, the Northeast, and the West, and today it's absolutely inverted. Why is that? Because Abraham Lincoln was a Republican, and that's the party that freed the slaves, so the South was a deeply Democrat. So it's not, I think, about, uh, that presuming the Toll College is not about uh, uh, avoiding regionalism. We have that anyway. A couple of other things people have said, well, wouldn't you have a, a recount nightmare if you have a national popular vote? Well, maybe, but maybe not. You, you, in 2000, we had a Fl Florida recount nightmare. Even though Al Gore won the national popular vote, so if all that had mattered was the national popular vote, Florida would have been irrelevant. We wouldn't have had to worry about Florida. Or in 2004, if things had been tighter in Ohio, we could have had a nightmare there, even though George Bush would have won the national vote by 3 million. So whether, whether a national popular vote would generate more or fewer recounts really just depends on the circumstances of any particular election. Some people also wor worry about whether a national popular vote will breed more third parties. Um, and I'm not sure third parties are a bad idea, but even if you think they are, we've had them in the United States. George Bush won in 2000 in large part because of Ralph Nader in Florida. People forget that. He's the one who stole the elections from, from, uh, from Gore. And throughout uh, America, you've got George Wallace, John Anderson, Ross Perot in 1992, for those of you who are old enough to remember that. We've had major third parties. And in any event, we don't have a third party problem in electing governors in big states. Right? We don't worry about whether in, in, in California we need something like an electoral college where Yolo County gets a certain amount of representation and Contra Costa County has a certain number of electors because we're worried about their president or third party problem in New York and Texas and California. And look at the population. In 1920, California has as many people as the United States did at the founding almost. And, and today, they have as many people as the United States did until about 1880. Okay? So it's not about any of those things. Um, which brings me to um, uh, the second story, which is a personal one, and, and uh, I'll try to keep this brief. In 2000, Bush won the Electoral College and lost the popular vote. And we had this nightmare in Florida that ended up in the Supreme Court, and it was an amazing kind of combination of in intense uh, legal and political wrangling. And I was a young law professor who teaches constitutional law at the time, and it was kind of a really heady experience to go through it personally. Um, we'd just come off an impeachment of a president, Bill Clinton, only the second impeachment in US history. Now we have the Supreme Court weighing in an election. We have this inversion between the popular vote winner and the Electoral College. And I, for one, thought that when, when a popular vote winner loses the presidency, that would galvanize support to revisit this anachronistic thing called the Electoral College. And it didn't happen. And I think it didn't happen for two reasons. One, because the Supreme Court stole the spotlight in, in November and December with what it was doing in the election in Florida, 
people were focusing on that rather than the weird outcome that we had that the guy who won the election lost nationally. So we, because we had two things going on at the same time, both of which were under, uh, if not unprecedented, exceptionally unusual, um, I think people lost the, one of them uh, for the other one. The other thing, of course, is it's really hard to change the Constitution. This is Article 5 of the Constitution that says both the House and Senate have to uh, propose an amendment by two-thirds vote, and then you need three-quarters of the legislatures to ratify. It's hard to get three-quarters of the states to do anything. So about a year after Bush versus Gore, um, there were a few law professors, Bob Bennett at Northwestern, and then my brother, who's a law professor on the East Coast, and I, uh, we were operating independently of Bob. We were writing some stuff about how maybe you could change the Electoral College without having to go through the complicated process of Article 5. And I want to give Bob and my brother a lot of the credit because they, I think, uh, contribute a lot of the important ideas. But the, the essence of the approach is the following. If enough states agree that they are going to pledge their electors, not to the person who wins in their state, but to the person who wins the national popular vote countrywide, then it doesn't matter what the other states do. As few as 11 states, if they are the right big 11 states, could bring about national popular vote by just saying, we're going to give our electors to the person who wins the country, regardless of whether he wins or loses here in our state. Um, so my brother and I wrote an online uh, column describing how this coordination between the states uh, could work. And at the time, you know, like most things, law professors write, you thought it's cute, it gets you a little bit of, uh, of credit in the academy, but I wasn't sure it was going to go anywhere. But um, it turns out that some, some folks at uh, Stanford and um, in the Bay Area, they started shopping this idea to state legislatures around the country and said, look, you adopt this plan, and it comes into being only when the requisite number of states agree. So you're not going to be hanging out on your own. You don't do this unless there are a bunch of other states that are pledged to do the same thing, and you need enough states to comprise more than half of the Electoral College so that it would actually be implemented if those states um, uh, adopted. And lo and behold, we've got, I, yesterday, the seventh state joined up. Vermont's the seventh state, plus... Uh, plus It's passed both houses of California, and Schwarzenegger vetoed it. But if California were to join, uh, then you'd almost be half the way there, what you need, in terms of the requisite number of states. Now, there's still a lot of political and legal hurdles to go. They, they, the, the, the organizers of this movement didn't actually follow our advice down the line. And they styled this thing in such a way that Congress would actually have to approve it once the states uh, enter into this coordinated agreement. Moreover, there are questions about how we count votes nationally if we're, if we're going to look at the national popular tally. In other words, right now, we don't really care how Florida counts its votes in California. But if the California electors were dependent on what happens nationwide, then maybe we want some uniformity in how votes are counted so, so as to uh, reduce corruption and the like. So there's lots of hurdles to, to come. But it's possible that in my lifetime, we will see some major change in this institution, which brings me to the uh, the four or five lessons that I want to close with. Um, one is we should not confuse what is legal with what is right. Um, we, have this, we have this instinct in, in, in the United States to say, well, if it's, if it's legal, then it's got to be correct. It's got to be morally right. There's lots of things that are legal that are just plain wrong. And I actually think the Electoral College, where people's votes aren't counted equally across the country, is one of them. Um, second, we have a history in this country of making things better. We don't need to settle for just okay. I think of the 27 amendments we have in the Constitution, I think every one of them improves the document, except maybe the 18th Amendment, which banned liquor, and that was repealed by the 21st Amendment. Um, <laughs> and even then, I have second thoughts of five. Maybe, maybe prohibition wasn't the worst thing in the world. But, um, but with the, putting those two aside, we have become a much better country, which brings me to my third point, and that is, a lot of the best things we think about in the United States Constitution came about as a product of amendment. A lot of the things that we associate with the Constitution to the best ideals of the Constitution were not part of the original document. They were the 15th Amendment, giving blacks the right, black men the right to vote. The 19th Amendment, extending the vote to women. Um, tweaks in, 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 uh, in, in the way we elect U.S. senators. So a lot of aspects reflect not uh, a reverence for 1787, 
but uh, an awareness of how we learn over time, and we should be uh, ready for that. And then fourth, when it comes to kind of major legal and constitutional change like this, you've got to be creative. I don't like the term thinking outside the box, but you can't assume that there's only one way to accomplish your goal. Article 5's amendment process, which requires three quarters of the states, is cumbersome. That's why Bob Bennett, my brother, and I brainstormed about are there ways to bring this about without going through something that you know is going to be blocked. Um, there are people who say, well, that's circumventing the Constitution. Circumvention is a conclusory term. Using the Constitutional's existing structure to, to, to bring about that, a change that, that is in keeping with the Constitution's highest values is not circumvention, that's creativity. And then fifth and finally, um, you gotta remember that a lot of the best ideas in the United States come from outside the Beltway. I clerked for one of the Supreme Court justices, Jerry Blackman, wonderful guy, wonderful institution. I was glad to see Keith that the, uh, the US Supreme Court fares okay on that, uh, that hierarchy. Um, I, I like uh, you know, um, uh, members of Congress and the president and the like, but some of the most important ideas and some of the most important change comes from the grassroots level. Uh, and uh, you see that in the uh, gay rights equality movement. None of that came from Congress <clears throat> or the President or the Supreme Court. So when you think about how to really make change, don't rely on our national elected representatives. Think creatively uh, at the local level as well. Okay, thank you very much.